I'm Jim Bryan, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I always like to read to you some of our emails before we teach. Uh, we are on the Internet. We've got about 2,000 of our messages on the Internet. We've got a total of 4,049 today. That's Master Messages, and we give those away free of charge. All you have to do is call us at 615-824-8502 or our 800 number is 1-800-625-5409 and we give these away free we're like paul said we give the gospel without charge we never charge people for the teachings and i get emails from all over the world from the internet and then we're on TV in about 370 towns and cities across America, all up and down the East Coast and the West Coast and all over the Midwest, all over Texas. And uh, these are people who write to us. James in South Carolina writes, Dear Jim, I never had a good father figure. My father took care of me, but never gave good examples to me to live a godly life. Jim, I see you as a teacher and male role model. I could look into I could look into Hollywood stars, but I want someone to lead and guide me to truth. My father lived in sin and gave the worst examples of living and taught me sin. I want a true male example like that of the Bible. There's many young men that need male role models cause it is hard to be true man, James in South Carolina. Well, I have had plenty of sin in my life. I'm trying to live godly and righteously, particularly over these last 30, 35 years. God has really dealt with my heart. So I hope, uh, just keep writing to us, James. And then Ryan Spears writes to us, no address. He says, how are we saved and get to heaven? The Bible, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Again is the word anothen, A-N-O-T-H-E-N, -E and it means from above. Our birth, our new birth has to come from above, and we have to have a new birth and become new creatures and new creations, but that's not something you do that's something God does in all of his predestinated elect family. If he's chosen you before the foundation of the world, he will birth you. John 1, 13 says, we were born, speaking of the new birth, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You have to repent, but you can't do that. God has to turn you Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, Jeremiah said, Jeremiah 31, 18, and 19. And when you turn me, I'll be turned. You can't turn away from sin. There's none that seeks after God. Nobody. So you have to be born again. You have to repent. But repent is something he causes you to do after he births you by his will. He'll cross your path with the preaching of the gospel. It'll cut into your heart if you're elect. If you're not elect and you're a vessel of breath fitted to destruction, there's nothing you can do and there's nothing you'll want to do to be born again. And that's just putting it mildly. We have to, he's predestined us to be conformed to Christ's likeness, to the image of his son. Image icon means likeness. So he puts you through fire and trials and burns out the old man, then the sinful fleshly man and the new man comes alive in you and it takes years to get rid of that old fleshly self and but the new man is perfect and the outer man is not i preach on that all the time i hope that answers your question ryan and then keep writing to us steve from cameroon writes to us Hi, Pastor. Hope all is well. While listening to 3908, a question popped up. Job received good report from God in chapter 1. Joseph of Arimathea was a common, pious man who was successful in business, so I learned. 
I would like to know, just like Abraham and the others in scriptures, is it possible to be a Christian and successful in enterprises? Well, certainly it is if you use good moral ethical practices. Uh, a lot of people, some people are self-starters. I'm a self-starter. I've been able to self-start from go and just take off. But what makes you a self-starter? Let me tell you what it is. It's simple. It's one word. Work, 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 work constantly. But you have to have that drive to do that. I had that in real estate. I had that in the music world. I had that in this ministry. I never say die, never quit. That's what it takes to be successful, Steve. Agape and Phileo, Steve from Cameroon. You've got to be honest and straight and work hard, and it will pay off. If we're faithful over a few things, he'll make us ruler over many. Then Demetrius, keep writing to us, Steve. Then Demetrius in Illinois. Dear Jim, I have received Christmas gifts this year on my first true attempt to have anything not to not have anything you got to tell people i won't accept your gift i'll send it back if you start participating they're going to say about you you don't mean he doesn't mean what he says christmas related in my house this year whatsoever i'm away from home and family has sent gifts in attempt to keep me and my wife and child in this fire. This Christmas was the best because me and a few brothers broke bread in truth. Thank you, Jim, for all you do in God's name. I was wondering if there are any followers of your church near me at Scott Air Force Base. I know where that is. That's in Belleville, Illinois. I've been there. Uh, agape, all at grace and truth. It's tough. I'll tell people, if you give me gifts, I told you not to give them. I'm going to take them out in the front yard and burn them. I don't care what's in them. Make people know that you mean it. Once you start taking, accepting a gift, say, well, I don't believe in Christmas, but I'll accept this just to make you happy. They're going to say you don't mean what you say, and they'll give you a hard time every year until you say, I won't accept your gifts. And that's what Christmas is about. It's about gifts. Uh, Demetrius, keep on writing and tell us what's going on. Doyle and Sandra in Arkansas write, Please keep sending the DVDs. Still learning. There is so much to learn. I learn every day. Uh, keep writing, Doyle and Sandra. And then Robert Bresnahan in Washington State writes, Robert's been with us for years. Jim, I stand in awe of your knowledge of the Bible and history and your willingness to share it with those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. I'm not a well-educated man. You don't have to be well-educated to have wisdom, and you have to be objective. Look at things the way they are and accept it. So your repetition of the word, supporting facts like basic English and math, is a great help in understanding. I still remember the time I heard you, the first time I heard you, one Saturday morning on the radio out in New Orleans in 2005. You were preceded by three programs with preachers that all ended they're preaching with offers of books or pamphlets or considerable cost. You, however, ended a, I never heard these things before, program with an offer I could not refuse. Free. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Jim. Your math taste, your disciple, Robert Breshnahan in Washington State. We love you, Robert. I love for somebody to say stuff like that. Because I say, Kenneth Copeland will charge eighty nine ninety five for a DVD, and he'll lie all the way through it. And I'll give you the truth free. 
<laughs> That's funny, isn't it? Thank you, Robert. That's very encouraging. Michael in Las Vegas. Pastor Jim, thank you for teaching me. Love your patience. I'm studying hard for Jesus, but I like running it by you because I respect your 64 years of Bible study. Crown of life is called the martyr's crown. It's not a... It's never a crown with the points on it. That's where that comes from. That comes from Nimrod. That's, and it got jewelry and it got diamonds and rubies all through it. That's not the crown of life. Where this comes from, the crown that men wear, are the horns on, on Nimrod. And you find that, that's where they had horns. Nimrod supposedly went out and killed a great bull with his hands. He was super strong. And he went out and killed a bull, put the horns on his head, tied the tail around his waist, and put the hooves on his feet. And we get the picture of Satan from that. And that's the horns. You find those horns, the American Indian, they were fire worshipers and they they put those horns of a buffalo on their head. The Vikings put the horns on their heads. You, everywhere you find it, even in what it is, it's kind of a cross between the horns of the bull and when you find those princesses in Europe wearing those long pointed hats, this has got a history to it. Uh, that's supposed to be the fish's mouth which is closed, and this is the fish's mouth, which is open, and that's the mitre on the head of the priest and the pope. And they all go back to the horns of Nimrod. That's in that where you get these crowns of kings. The crowns that the Bible speaks of, we will receive a crown. Everybody that participated in the races had this oak leaf. People say, where do you get that? Out of many books had these oak leaves on their head, and everybody that participated in the games got the oak leaf. And it came around to the front of the head and didn't meet. That's what it is. Let me see what else he's got to say here. I hope you guide me to specific video titles where you taught on five crowns. Otherwise, I won't be able to find them on YouTube. It sounds like God has us categorized in heaven. We each get only one of these crowns. Why would we be rewarded for what God does in us? Paul's not going to get any more rewards than you when it's God that works in you to willing to do his good pleasure. I'm not going to get any more than anyone here. The reward that we give is even eternal life. What books are you finding the history that A martyr's crown is an oak leaf about the Agon Arena. You're going to get that out of many books, McClendon and Strong, Hastings' Encyclopedia of Religion. You're going to have to look up the right things in those books. A lot of times I'll just pull a McClendon and Strong out. This happens all the time. I'll be just thumbing through it. I'll start reading on on some subject. I say, I didn't know that. I find it out as I read. I learn every day. You've got to get books by the by the writers, by Greek writers, by Hebrew writers. I can't just give you. I've got a long list of books I recommend. Then I've got a short list. We'll send you the short list, but the long list is on the internet, and you can't buy all of those. There's several hundred in the short list, in the long list. I've got several thousand books in my library in my house. You can't get all of them. I can't tell you everything that I read and I read out of. It comes in various books. The best research books are McClinic and Strong and Hastings and anything by the Jews like Alfred Edersheim. He was a Jew born in 1825 died in 1889, converted to Christianity and retained a lot of culture in his books, which you've got 
the life and times of Jesus the Messiah, the sketches of the Jewish social life, the templeless ministry and services, and the history of Israel. A lot of things I say comes from Mr. Edersheim. And then you that's Hebrew culture of the first century. Then you need, since the Greeks kept their culture going and the Romans were such barbarians slaughtering everybody, they all used the Greek language, Greek culture, Greek philosophy, Greek metaphors. If you find any books on Stoicism, the Stoics or the Epicureans, get that because Paul, those are the two most popular philosophies in the first century. So be sure and get anything by the Epicureans and Stoics. Many times Paul is using Stoic or Epicurean philosophy in teaching the people. That's what he meant when he said, I become all things to all men that I might be all means save some so we could reach them. Uh, I'm not asking about Strong's, that definitions. I'm asking about culture, history, books about Agon Arena and Martyr's Crown. It's in a lot of books. There's Mr. Scherer, S-A-S-C-H-U-R-E-R. He's got like five volumes on Jews in the first century. You've got the Compendia, C-O-M-P-E-N-D-E-I-A, one of my favorites, P-E-N-D-I-A, the Compendia. First two volumes, the Jews in the first century. They're expensive, but if you can get those, those are very good. God bless Michael in Las Vegas. We love you, Mike. Keep writing to us. Andrea in Wisconsin, thank you so much for your emails. I'm grateful that the ministry records Pastor Jim's teachings. I am very interested in DVDs. My son gave me a portable hard drive to download the past messages. Well, we got 4,049 today. Take you a lifetime to go through them. It's quite overwhelming to me as there are so many. My son is one who introduced me to your ministry, and I am so grateful. I do want to have these messages at hand in case our Internet service would cease at some point. Thank you for your passion in your studies, Pastor Jim. Andrea in Wisconsin. We love you, Andrea. Keep writing. Ian Han, that's E-I-A-N-H-A-H-N, writes, Hi, Jim. Blessings. I would like to know where to get the dictionaries of the words in Greek that you use. Well, you got to get a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance to start with. That's just the beginning. You can get that in just about any uh, bookstore, Christian bookstore, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. It has every word in the Bible listed alphabetically. This is one right here. It's alphabetical, and it if and the Old Testament was written, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible. And then every word is listed alphabetically. And when you look up a word, like ordained, It'll have, starting in the Old Testament, it'll go all the way through, and it'll give you all the verses for ordained. When you get to New Testament, it'll have a number to the right of the word. It'll have a number right here. So if, if this is a New Testament word, the New Testament was written in Greek. You get down here to the New Testament, it's written in Greek. You go back to the back of your concordance to the Greek dictionary. You look up that number, and then it'll give you the number, and then you it'll give you the word in the Greek, how it's spelled, like O R G A. That's orge. It means the wrath, anger of man, and then it'll it'll give you. How it's pronounced in Greek, in English, O R G E, and then it'll give you a definition. And it may say C and give you another number. Well, you have to look at that because it comes from that number. So that's where you start studying in the Greek. 
And this brick is not hard. How, I keep saying, how hard could it be? Every five-year-old in the first century was speaking a form of Greek. Every one of them. So how hard could it be for us? It's not. Our alphabet is basically their, their alphabet up, up here. A, B, G, D. Not A, B, C, D. How can they put G between B and D? Because they were here first. <laughs> That's why. A, B, G, D, and then E, Z, E. Why can they put Z here instead of at the end of the alphabet? They were here first. They can do what they wanted to do. And you got a short E, E, like met. Then you got a long E like they. So they just think A, B, G, D, E, Z. And then you have a TH, like TH, theta. The, it's two letters in our alphabet. <gasps> It's one letter in theirs. You got four letters in the Greek that are that are two letters in our alphabet. Phi, key, phi, phi, like phileo, p h i l e o. That's one of the words that has been mistranslated to love. And then c h c h r e s t o s or c h r i s t o s, which is Christ. And Christos means kind. And then you got P-S, P-S-U-C-H-I-K-O-S. Pazukikos, natural, the natural man. This is a Z. And then you got two different O's. This one's pronounced O, and this one over here is pronounced Ah. Now, so here's the alphabet. A-B-G-D. E Z T H. Then you're into our alphabet. If you can learn this up here, A B G D, an E Z, and a T H, you're to our alphabet. I K, no J, I K L M N X. X is just like a Z. They can put it there because they were here first. This is not an X, this is a key, a C H. This is an X, a Kazi, K S E E. And then you got O P, no Q, no J's and no Q's in the alphabet. O P R, their R looks like our, you just knock the front leg off and you got their R. S, this is an S in the middle of a word, this is an S on the end of a word. Should have put that up here. This is a capital S. T, tau, u, upsilon. So there you are. I, K, L, M, N, X, O, P, R, S, T, U. You already know that. Is that pretty easy? That's easy, isn't it? And then you have K, Z, and Omega. All right. I hope that helps, Ian. So you're going to have to get a strong exhaustive concordance. I'm not going to talk about the interlinear Bible. That's more advanced. Get the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance first. Ian, keep writing to us. I, give me a call. I'll talk to you about it. Then Anthony Mao in Wisconsin writes, Jim, thank you again for the resources you referred me to. Edersham, Lightfoot, Mounts, well, not M-O-U-N-T-S, M-O-U-N-C-E, M-O-U-N-C-E, etc. via our phone dialogue. I'll do my best to be concise, but wanted to verify with your wisdom if I'm interpreting this properly. Preface, I have always had a conflict of Sunniticis with mobs in the outer man hierarchy. Sunniticis is the word conscience. Soon, E I D E S I S, is a construction of soon and ido. Ido means to see with. I'm not going to go any further than that. I can teach on that all day long. 
I'm an honorably discharged Marine infantry veteran, so is it not an authority complex, but rather a hypocrisy complex? No, this is conscience. An honest fool is better than a dishonest man of rank. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so he's saying a, an honest private is better than a dishonest general. Main question is it in alignment to speak the truth and adhere to God's instruction entirely devoid of hope of being chosen? Absolutely. You tell the truth regardless of what the consequences are. You got to learn that the people that make it up the ladder in the world are those that compromise and don't live and tell the truth. I'm concluding so. Well, good for you. It is pure this way for me. It has been apparent to me that adhering to the commands provides humble rewards in this flesh. That's right. Be a gentle, good, honest person. Don't be pushy about yourself. I learned years ago, pushy people are the ones that move themselves out in front. Most stars have been real pushy with their talents. You got to hear me. I know all about that. Being of clear mind allows me to practice and improve the abilities given to me by God. Additionally, God may have made me want to study and learn the truth to cross the path of the chosen one and impact them while not being chosen myself. That's right. You'll impact the world. There was a certain man, Ecclesiastes said, and there was a man, and he was just a little nobody, but he was a man of wisdom. Then there was a great king that couldn't conquer the enemy, and this one little man had wisdom enough to conquer the enemy, and when he helped conquer the enemy, he was forgotten. That's the way it works. You can't look to be special. You're special in God's eyes. I'm okay with this conclusion. I strive to completely reject the temptation of what's in it for me. Good for you. And I wanted to make sure this was not incorrect, borderline, flagellant. Finally, is it just heaven and hell or do the servants that are not chosen have a place? I'm okay returning to Adama, but eternal torment does sound inviting. Ha ha. Thanks, Jim. Anthony Mao in Wisconsin. Thank you for your honesty, Anthony. You're exactly right. I'm going to tell the truth. I don't care who likes it. I don't care if my wife likes it. I don't care if my son likes it. My daughter doesn't like it. She hates it with a passion. Well, that's going to be her problem with God at the judgment. Now, I got some YouTube comments. Most of these people don't like me. <laughs> the emails like me. The YouTube, some of them come after me. Krabit Amofo commented on Doctrine of the Devil, the Pharisees, rabbis of the Babylonian synagogue. Jesus is not God. He is a messenger of God. You know nothing about the Bible. Jesus said to the Pharisees in John the 8th chapter, at the end of the chapter, Jesus said, he's telling the story of Abraham, and he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. The Pharisees said, you're not even 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And they pick up stones to stone him because he made himself God. Kenneth Colton said, Jesus never called himself God. When he said, I am, when he told Moses, you go tell Pharaoh, let my son go, Israel, my son, even my firstborn. And when I get, Moses said, well, who shall I say sent me when I get to the Jews who've been in captivity for 400 years and they, and they, they made me not remember who you are. And the Lord said, you tell the people of Israel, I am hath sent me to you. 
So Jesus called himself the Jehovah God of the Old Testament. Krabitamofo, you don't know nothing about the Bible. Honor the Lord commented on Sabbath is ceasing on work, sin. Hi, Brother Jim. Do you know what I noticed? A lot of times we are on the same page. I give thanks to God for that. His Spirit definitely brings unity among the body of Christ. Okay, so in other news, please pray for me because those who teach false doctrine are kind of getting on my nerves. <laughs> me too. <laughs> There's a lot of things going on around that I have never heard of before, like universalism. I can talk about that all day long. Universalists believe that God's going to save everybody in the world because he says he would have all men be saved and that he's going to pour out of his spirit on all flesh. All men is opposed to one man in the Old Testament, one man. And the man was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their descendants, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and only Israel was given the call to truth in the Old Testament because they went after Baal in the grove. God scattered them all over the world, blinding their eyes, and said, now I'll call all men, I'll call red, yellow, white, black, and brown men. Now all men will be saved, and I can talk about that for hours, but I don't have time. I've got all kinds of, look on the internet, anything that says all men are all flesh. And I'll explain the thing completely. They had a word, synecdoche, it mean a part of something was the whole. If one red, one yellow, one black, one bright, white, one brown man was saved, they would say all men were saved. That's like Eight souls were saved in the flood. All men were saved in the flood, from the flood. All right. Fire and Ice writes, Billy Graham, the world's most famous liar in the last 2,000 years. Now, here's what he commented. He don't like me. You, sir, are an idiot. No, you're the idiot. Id idiotes. I-D-I-O-T-E-S, idiotes, or E-I-D-O, E-I-D-O. Idiotes means ignorant. In the title, I've got the reason that he's a false teacher, the world's most famous liar in the last 2,000 years. He says, I rebuke you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're a heretic. You, you, you don't even know what heretic means. Heretic, H-A-I-R-T-I-K-O-S. It comes from heresis, H-A-I-R-E-S-I-S, -S, and that's the same word as sect every time you find it. It actually means a denomination. It means de nomos. It means to set off your own law. Nomos is the law, means to set off your own law. That's a denomination. And Billy Graham, Billy Graham, like I said in the title, was the most popular man in the world for 48 years. He was on the top of the popularity charts. Let me give you something to wrestle with, Fire and Ice 909. The Bible says, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. If you're popular in the world, the Pope like Billy Graham, Billy Graham sought his blessing. The Pope is a pagan. The Dalai Lama, the head of the Buddhist religion, loved Billy Graham. All of the presidents loved him except Harry Truman, who said he was a phony. The world loved him. The Bible says, Woe unto you, O U A I, U I, O U A I. That's a cry of damnation if the whole world likes you. Billy Graham has been the most popular preacher in the world, 
He preached to millions of people in person as well as on TV and in books. He preached accept Christ, which is a lie. He preached that for salvation. The Bible says the dead man cannot accept anything spiritual. He preached sinner's prayer for salvation. The Bible says you can't call on a God you don't believe in. And all of the preachers in America got hold of those two doctrines, and they have just literally crushed the church with those doctrines. My father preached that. I called down my father's message a long time before I called down Billy Graham's. If I'll call down my father for teaching lies, believe me, I'll call down Billy Graham. He preached the same thing Graham preached. Billy Graham was, the Bible says, whosoever be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Billy Graham was friends with everybody. He liked the world. That's one thing you can't be. You cannot be famous. Bless you to even when men shall reproach you. Reproach, O-N-E-I-D-I-Z-O. It means to be infamous. You're blessed when you're infamous, not when you're as famous as Billy Graham was. And he was a real nice guy. Probably wouldn't make a better neighbor than anybody in the neighborhood. He just didn't tell the truth. I'm not mad at him because he was ugly. He had a big square jaw and a great big round voice. Praise God today. And <laughs> But the world liked him because he preached an easy... He preached the other Jesus that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 11 and 4. Some will come preaching another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. And he tells us the other Jesus is Satan transforming himself into an angel of light. Transform metaschematizo means to disguise oneself. Satan comes transforming himself disguised as Jesus. If you're going to preach the truth, you have to be hated by the world. Jesus said so himself. If the world hate me, it'll hate you. You cannot be popular and be loving God. Let me get on with this. All right. I would appreciate it if you would give, if you could give me some teaching concerning the false doctrine and also how to handle those who have come out of church and false doctrine, yet they are still deceived and full of anger toward the saints. I don't believe everybody's a saint that goes to church. Saint and holy are the same word. Hagios means to be pure and be taken through fire and trial. They're not saints if they go to a church and they practice false doctrine. Keep on writing to us, honor the Lord. Have and then when Fire and Ice is the one that wrote me, uh, I'm a heretic. <laughs> Fire and Ice is kind of stupid because he's wrote me before. Ebooks 210 commented on Sabbath is resting and predestination. Uh, Genesis 1 2 Satan corrupts our universe. Does everyone have a spirit given by God? No! There's two spirits. The Holy Spirit's truth. John 14, 15, 16. John 15, 26. The Holy Spirit. 1 John 5 and 6. The Holy Spirit is truth. And then you have an evil spirit, which is daemonion. D A I M O N I O N. That's our word demon. There's no such thing as demons. Demons are self. That's your spirit. You have a evil spirit. That tries to take care of this flesh. And then Jeffrey Lewis commented on Christmas is the reason for disease. Is getting a tattoo a sin? <laughs> Well, the Jews had, God had a tattoo. Did you know that? God says, I've graven you 
in the palm of my hand. That was something that the women did when their son went off to war. They'd have a tattoo put of their son in their hand or some mark so they could look at it and think of their son. I'm not saying go out here and get tattooed all over your body. That, that's going to be awful hard when you try to be a preacher and you got streaks of tattoos all over your face. You don't want to bring any reproach upon the name of Christ. I wouldn't put tattoos on my body. I'm not going to get mad at somebody. The Jews had tattoos. They also wore, they wore earrings and nose rings. I can't get into all that right now. Love you, Jim. I hope you are all hanging in there. Thank you, Jeffrey Lewis. And uh, that's all the reading I'm going to do. I can't comment all I want to on these things because there's so much to answer. Uh, you've heard me teach on a bunch of them, take an hour and a half, and I still don't go through all of it. But uh, if you want a free DVD, they're yours free of charge. Like I said earlier, you can call 1-800-625-5409. That's our long-distance number. Don't cost you anything to call our 800 number. Or you can call us locally at 615-824-8502. And we give the truth without charge. We'll never ask you for money. We ask for money for one thing, the poor. I have a real heart for the poor and the needy. Uh, we give money. We don't cheat the poor out of their money. Let me tell you something. The 22nd chapter of Exodus says, Moses, you tell Israel, if they oppress the widow and the orphan, and the widow and the orphan cry unto me, I'll hear their cry, and you tell Israel, I'll kill you with the sword if you cheat these poor needy people. Boy, that's an indictment against the Charismatics, isn't it? Benny Hinn, Oral Roberts, all those crooks, Jesse Duplantis, Kenneth Copeland. God's going to kill you. He'll kill you with the sword of his mouth, which is the word of God, and put you in hell forever. Now, you want a free DVD? Ask for them. Or go on the Internet, and you can look at all of our these several thousand that we've got. We've got about 2,000 of our messages on the Internet. And uh, all you have to do is ask for them. Graceandtruth.net. That's all you have to do. You can watch them on the Internet, or you can ask for them. So you can give them away to people. It's not any big thing for us to put you on the mailing list. We gather together on Friday night, or there are certain ones that gather together. They package up several hundred or thousand DVDs to, pay, to send around the world. We'll just put your name in the middle of that, and it don't. the DVDs only cost about 15 cents a piece. And Kenneth Copeland will, will give you an hour of lies for eighty nine ninety five on a DVD. We give them away. Anyway, we're on TV in Nashville Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night on Comcast Channel 49. We're also on Sunday morning, same Channel 49, Comcast, uh, Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. And we're on the radio in Nashville every Saturday morning at 8 to 9 o'clock on WNQM. That's 1300 on the AM dial. Then we're on WNAH, which is... WNAH is another radio station, 1360 on the dial. We're on there on 1360 every day, Monday through Friday, Six, seven in the morning, eight in the morning, nine in the morning, and we're on at four in the afternoon. That's Monday through Friday. Then we're on Saturday at seven o'clock. We're on at ten thirty, and we're on at twelve thirty on Saturday. 
They were on Sunday at 1.30. So you can turn on WNAH and listen to us all day long, and you'll hear us all through the day. All right. I think that's all I've got. We've... I just want to remind you, our piano player, Judy, broke her leg lifting up a bed, and she's had an operation, and she's recouping, and we love you, Judy and Dave and Betty, and uh, love y'all very much. And then we've had people with one of our all-time, uh, my old guitar player I used to play for me, Butch Davis, William Carlos Davis, he passed away this past week. And uh, Butch was an unbelievable guitar player, the best I have ever been around. He played classical guitar and played pop music, everything you can think of. He did a lot of session work. And he passed away. He was 69. And... Uh, we sent him some flowers this afternoon. I really love Butch. He was like a brother to me. He's the only person, the only one I worked with in the music business for 20-something years that really said he believed everything that I was teaching. And I would go by and sing from time to time. He came to church for a while, but he got real bad emphysema and he couldn't come anymore. But he passed away recently, so I just wanted you to know that. I, if I got other things to say, I don't know what they are. Uh, we do, we appreciate your giving to the ministry. I never ask for money. We believe that the people that listen to us, if they really believe in what we're saying, we believe they'll want to support this ministry. If you want to, if you want love the defined truth of the Word of God, I go to the Greek text. I go to the Hebrew text. I may put fifty Greek words on the board in one lesson, break the syllables down, and tell you what they are in the Greek, what part of speech they are, if it's a participle or a verb, or a noun or a pronoun, and what it means. I don't believe you can really study the Bible correctly without doing that. Well, I'm ready to teach. I hope you'll keep supporting the ministry. We need all the support we can get. We're on TV all over the country. It takes about $10,000 a month to pay our TV bill every month. Just the TV bill, nothing else. So uh, that's it. I'm ready to teach.
And I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I'm teaching something that most people don't really understand. I'm trying to help you to understand wh why God created sin. God created it because when did sin start? It started in the garden where it started. It started with the tree, with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, knowledge of good and evil. And that was in the center of the garden. <coughs> the center of the garden. You had a tree there. And God had told Adam, you can eat of all these other trees, but you cannot eat of that. Now, who came up with the idea to put a tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Who, whose idea was that? Was that Adam's? No, he wasn't created yet. It couldn't have been Cain. It couldn't have been anybody but God. And who came up with the idea to make a law? A law. A law is a boundary line that says you cannot pass this boundary. The boundary was that tree, was that circle around the tree in the garden. I was asked this past week, what's the mark of the beast? It was here in the beginning. Mark is the word karagma. C-H-A-R-A-G-M-A. Karagma in the mark in the in the book of Revelation is karagma it means character. What is the character of the beast? Character. What is his character? The word character is name. Name means character. It's the word onoma. Onoma in the Greek. It's the word shim in the Hebrew. What is the character of Satan? It was in that tree right there. And who put, who planted the tree? God. Whose idea was it? God. And who made the law? God. Who said you can eat of all these trees out here, but you can't eat of that tree in the middle of the garden? God. God set it up. But he didn't tell Adam, if you eat of the tree, if is not in the text. If. Forget that. He said, the day you eat, you will die. Now, I was listening to R.C. Sproul yesterday on the radio, and he had somebody call in and say, now, he's dead now, and he had somebody call in and said, uh, some Calvinists said that God created all the evil and the sin. He wanted man to sin. That's exactly true. And R.C. Sproul talked around and around and around in a circle, and he never really got to any kind of a point. That's because whenever I say that God created sin and he wanted man to sin so he could be angry at it, I keep saying this. If, how can you have mercy? Mercy. L-E-I-O, E-L-E-O-O. -E it actually means to be merciful and do something about it. How can you have mercy upon somebody if you don't have any wrath? It's like, how can you have up and there is no down? How can you have sweet if there is no sour or bitter? If there was no sour, no down, and no wrath, what would you call mercy? What would you call up? What would you call sweet? They'd have no definition. You'd, go, you'd have to call them, oh. There wouldn't be no sweet if there was no bitter or sour. God created sin when he created Adam out of corrupt dust. You know, this is really amazing to me. A man and a woman will do the same thing that God did. They will get together, say, let's have a baby. Now, they know when they have the baby that the baby is going to 
grow and misbehave and be rebellious somewhere along the way. And they though they're going to have to correct the baby. The Bible says, visit their transgression with the, with the rod. It will not kill them. And don't be disturbed because of their crying. It amazes me people realize that if they're going to have a child, a man and a woman get together, that they're going to have to correct it. Now, the child could grow up and say, I didn't ask to be born, so you don't need to hold me accountable for my wrongdoing and my sin. Well, people try to say that same thing about God. Why would God hold a man accountable if the man can't keep from doing wrong? There's a verse that I have been dealing with, and it's over there in the book of James. Now, I've got to really make this clear so you'll understand. In James, the first chapter, the Bible is talking about what makes a man sin. The Bible says it's his own lust. But where did he get his lust from? That's the point. God could have created all of us perfect so none of us could have sinned. And we know that's true because will he do that in eternity? Will he give all of the believers pure bodies? And when he gives us a new body, is it going to be without sin? Well, yeah, it is. If he gives us new bodies in eternity and they won't be able to sin, why didn't he do that from the beginning? Because he didn't want to. To, and this was his program. He has a family that he has our names written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. Before the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was created. Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. For what? For a people down here that he's picked out and chosen his predestinated elect family. And that's all happened before the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was there. How did that come about? I've said this already. I've said it and I need to keep on saying it and tie it all together. When the Bible says in the beginning, in the beginning. God created. Create is a righteous term. Create is the word bara. It means to cut and make fat. Make fat. I keep saying this. Fat to the Jew did not mean cellulite on your side. It means the richest of the cattle, the richest of the land, the richest of everything. And then the earth became without form and void. It was without form. That is not the fat that God created in the first verse. Without form is the word tohu, T-O-H-U-W. If you go over there to Isaiah 45, I'm giving you a quick review. Isaiah 45 and 18, God says, When I created the earth, I created it not in vain. I did not create in vain in vain is the word tohu. Same word is without form. God says, when I created the, the earth and all the heavens and the earth, I did not create tohu without form. I didn't do that. Why do people not understand that? It boggles my mind. So between verses 1 and 2, you find in Revelation 12, Satan and his angels were cast out of heaven. And his angels, the fallen angels, went into Tartarus. That's the lowest pit of hell. And they're reserved for the judgment, Tartarus. It's the only time the word hell is translated from the word Tartarus. Tartarus mentioned one time in Second Peter, the second chapter. So they are reserved for the day of judgment reserved tereo means they're guarded in hell or in tartarus and they can't get out they're not running around spirits that are going to intermarry women 
So God takes the earth is without form and void and darkness, and God says, that's not what I created in the beginning. I did not, and from Barah we get the word bereth, which is the word covenant. The covenant of God is not without form and darkness. So when you get down to the earth is corrupt. The Bible says the stars are not pure in his sight. The moon is not clean. Man is not clean. And he picks up this corrupt dust and makes Adam out of corruption. And out of this corrupt dust, when he makes him out of corruption, he says, Thou shalt not, and you can't keep from eating it. The day you do, you'll die. You have to go back to that between verses 1 and 2 to come up with. People want to call this some, some strange theory that they call, they call it the gap theory. No, that's not a gap. There were six days of making and forming, but there were not six days of creation. Whatever this creation was, we don't know nothing about it. He has six days of making and forming. The six days of a potter. I'm going to say it one more time. Create is not the word made. Create is a righteous word. In fact, the Jews said create was the word ex nihilio. E-X-N-I-H-I-L-I-O which means to breathe out of nothing. God created all the earth and everything out of the breath of his mouth. Create is just the breath. Adam was formed, yatsar, which is the word potter. A potter, piece of pottery, you just put it on a potter's wheel, pound it and make it and put some water on it and form it. That's forming. That's not create. And he formed Adam over the dust of the ground. So, he picked up this man, formed him over the dust of the ground, and says, don't eat of that tree, and the day you do, you will die. Adam had to sin. God created sin because he created the tree. He created Adam out of corruption and said, you can't keep from sinning, and I've got a program for you and everyone else whose names are written in the book of life and the Christ is the Lamb slain and every one of his predestinated elect will come to Christ and that takes you back to the inner man and the outer man. The outer man is sin. Yeah, man is not, the only thing about man that's perfect is the inner man. That's Christ in you. That was the new birth. That's how you, how you go to heaven. New birth. It's something God has to do. It's God that works in you to the will and to do of His good pleasure. Philippians 2.13. Now, trying to get into all of this is something else. I want to get into Cain and Abel, the firstborn and the secondborn. Cain was illegitimate. He had no inheritance. The main thing about Genesis 4 and Genesis 5. Genesis 5 is the righteous lineage of God's family. It's God's righteous lineage. Genesis 5 starts with Adam. And the reason it's righteous, Cain's lineage doesn't go back to God, Cain. You can find his lineage in Genesis 4. This is Adam's lineage here. Adam's lineage starts with God has a son. His son, his name was Adam. And Adam has a son. His name is Seth. What in the world is Seth doing in the middle of this? In Genesis 4, verse 25, the Bible says, after Cain kills Abel, this is very important. I want to bring out the firstborn and the secondborn. The firstborn is rejected. 
Cain, I believe with all my heart, was an illegitimate bastard son of Adam and Eve. The reason, let me give you something that may really, it will get you confused if you don't know something about it. Look over here in Genesis, the second chapter, the very end of the chapter, very end of the chapter. And unless I explain it, you're probably not going to see it. Now, let's look at the second chapter, verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Notice wife is there. I thought you said he was illegitimate. Let me show you about this. They were both naked, O Rob, nude, and they didn't know it. The man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Remember, wife was the term, wife was the betrothed term. The engagement part, the man would come to his, to his the woman that had been bought and paid for by his father and had been arranged by a friend of the bridegroom. That would be the father and the Holy Spirit. And the, and the bridegroom would come and meet his wife. In Jesus' case, that would be the church, the wife, the bride of Christ. And when he came... He would say these words out of John 14. Start in verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in my Father, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many, it says rooms. And he would go to his Father's house. He says, now, I'm going to leave you, but don't be troubled. I'll come again and receive you unto myself. But in the meantime, I'm going to go to my father's house and build a room on my father's house to put you in, wife. She was called wife during the betrothal period. She was not called the bride until the night she was taken out to go to the house of the father. That's when she was called the bride. So she's only the wife right here. They're not married yet. They haven't been given the marriage vows. So when they eat of the tree, the Bible says in verse 7 of chapter 3, and the eyes of them both were opened. They knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. When a man looks at a naked woman, a beautiful naked woman, he wants her and she wants him. And they both found out they were naked and they took each other at that point. They had to have taken each other because she becomes pregnant. The Bible says so. Well, who got her pregnant besides Adam? There was no other man in the world. It had to be Adam when he looked at her. And then he says down here in verse 10, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. You know why he was afraid? I believe because he took her sexually. He was probably the best-looking man in the world. He was the only man in the world. <laughs> and she was the most beautiful woman in the world. She's the only woman in the world. Then when you get on down here, and God reprimands Satan and her. And he says in verse 15, he comes to the woman after she's been deceived. Adam was not deceived. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, he, the second chapter, he was not deceived because he got the message straight from God. She got it from him. He says, God said we can't eat of that tree. Then he says to the woman, I will put enmity between thee and, thy, thee and, the, thee and the woman between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's very, very important. What that's talking about, the seed of the woman is not going to be 
The seed of the woman is not going to be Cain. The seed of the woman is going to be is going to be Abel, and out of Abel's lineage, in Abel's lineage will go all the way down Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, and then you get on to uh, Enoch, and then Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. And out of Noah will come Shem, the second born, it's the same way Abel was second born, and Shem will be blessed. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and he'll rule over Ham and Japheth. And Japheth. And Shem, we get the word Semitic from that. And this Semitic bloodline goes all the way down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you can find that. You can find that in Genesis, the 11th chapter. Starts here, ends up here. Takes you to Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. Israel, in the 32nd chapter of Genesis, and he becomes Israel, and he's got 12 sons, 12 sons that become the nation. This is the promised lineage of God. Cain has no lineage because he's a bastard son, and he had no promise, and that was before before, before Adam and Eve had been permission to take one another sexually, intimately. So they didn't have any, they had no, no permission from God. That's why they were afraid and ashamed because they were naked. I believe that. Because the next verse says, the next verse says here in verse 16, this is a really important verse. Unto the woman... Now, she's been listening to God talk to the serpent that I'll multiply, that I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed. It's not talking about Satan has an affair with Eve. It's not talking about that. His seed was when he spoke into the ear of Eve and said, Did God say? His seed was words. They were evil words. He put God's word in question. And this verse 16 is very important. She was a wife before. She hasn't become the bride yet. Unto the woman, he said, I will multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Conception, heron, H-E-R-O-W-N. Let me really emphasize this. H-E-R-O-W-N. Her own conception does not, does not mean your future conceptions. It means your pregnancy that you already have. Where in the world does she get pregnant? Only one place it could have happened when they found out they were naked there's no other place she could have become pregnant, could she? Not at all. That's why Cain has no place in the lineage of God. You're going to find later on that out of Cain comes the Gentiles. I believe one of the daughters of Cain intermarried into Israel, intermarried the lineage of Seth, and that was a mixed marriage or giving in marriage, mixed marriage. People call this creating, I heard one preacher say on the internet last night, I don't believe in creating uh, anything, just take the Bible as it says it and preach it like it is. You think God is a simple-minded God? When I teach on salt of the earth being sodium chloride, and there's no doubt that that's exact truth, biblical. When I preach on gomatria, or I preach on, I preach on biblical chemistry or biblical algebra, and you call that creating, that's not creating. God is a lot smarter than preachers give him credit for being. He's the head of all science, all chemistry, all physics, all astrophysics, everything. 
I believe there's a lot more in the Bible than we've ever discovered. So, Cain had no part of the lineage of God. That's why he's left out. And that's why I said last week, Adam had a son. His name was Seth, means substitute. Means substitute. Well, sub Seth was the substitute for Abel. It was it was. I've said this last week, but I really want to make it clear. Seth was Abel's substitute. It was the law of the Jews that when one of the sons died without any children, that the surviving son, Deuteronomy 25 will tell us this. When you look at verse 25 of chapter 2, Two, I mean, of chapter 3, that Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bare a son instead of or in the place of Abel whom Cain slew. And that son was Seth. Seth was a substitute for Abel. This is Abel's lineage in chapter 5. That's the sons of God which are chapter 5 that go all the way back to God, intermarrying the daughters of men, it had to be one of Cain's female descendants that married Ham, that married Ham, because Ham begins, he actually starts Babylon. Babylon. Him and his descendants, his grandson was Nimrod who began the Babylonian system. And out of Babylon came that virgin birth, not the true virgin birth, but the false virgin birth. Let me show you where I believe that they got that. When one of these descendants intermarried into the lineage of God through Ham's descendants, Nimrod, you had Cush, going right at, he was the son of Ham, and Cush's son was Nimrod. Let me show you what I believe. Where they got that false, all those gods of the ancient world, they were said to be virgin born. Where did it come from? I believe it came from Genesis 4 and 1. From Eve's words. Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said about Cain, she didn't know nothing about nine months pregnancy. She didn't know anything about deliverance, and she thought that what that came out of her womb came from God. She said so. I have gotten this man, this Cain, from the Lord. He said he would multiply my conception and it's here. So she tells Cain he's virgin born and it goes all down through here and it marries into Ham's family, Nimrod, and he starts this false virgin birth. There is a virgin birth of Christ, but all those fire gods said to Hercules or Attis, they were said to be virgin born. But they weren't. That was a myth and a fairy tale. That was started by Eve in Genesis 4 and 1. I believe that. You can't just have some concept in here and not believe you have to understand where it came from. That's why when a man is drawn away of his own lust, when he goes into sin there in James, the first chapter, he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Where did he get his lust? Epithumia. To long for that which is forbidden. Epi means to cover with heavy breathing, hard breathing. Thumos means hard breathing. I want. It comes from that outer man. Where did the outer man come from? It came from creating Adam out of corruption. 
That's where it come from. It's always been here. Not if you sin. You will sin, and the day you sin, you're going to die spiritually. I don't know why I can see that and other people can't see it. Now, let's get back to Seth being the substitute. It was the custom. Well, let's go back to it in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 25, verse 5. This is the law among the Jews, and I've covered this last week, but I want to show you and cover it again. All right. All right. Deuteronomy 25, it was the law. This is a law that when, when a man is married in Israel and he dies without children, here's what's required. 25. I don't know why people don't want to be interested enough to find out where things started. You can do this by simple deduction, mathematical deduction. You find out in mathematics what isn't true. A lot of times you find out what the truth is by finding out what is not true. And Cain, it's not possible that Cain and Abel were twins. Could not have been possible. Because Cain had no inheritance anywhere. Now, look here in Deuteronomy 25, verse 5. If brethren dwell together, it's talking about brothers. One of them die. That was Abel died. And have no child. Abel had no children. And the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. You can't marry outside of Israel to a stranger. You got to take your brother that died, his wife, and raise up the firstborn son to him. That's what the Bible says. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of the husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn, let's just say Seth, firstborn, which she beareth, the firstborn that's legal, because Cain wasn't legal. Which he beareth shall succeed in the name of the brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. Let's continue. And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel, he will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. It's his duty in Israel to marry. So that's exactly what Seth did. People say, where did these men get their wives? Is that, have you ever thought of that? Let me tell you where they got them. They married their sisters. <laughs> That's who they married. That was true in Israel. God said to Israel, do not marry these foreigners, these pagans that are uh, fire worshipers and tree worshipers. Do not do that. I would prefer that you stay and marry inside of Israel to your sisters. He told them that over and over again. <laughs> That's why that's why he wasn't saying, don't intermarry the races. That's where these racist people come up with their idea. That's where the KKK comes up with their idea. Don't take their daughters to your sons. Don't intermarry races. That's not what he's talking about. When you read in the seventh chapter of Deuteronomy, I didn't choose you, Israel, because you're the greatest of nations. You're the smallest. And you cannot intermarry with these people because if you do, you'll worship their gods. The woman will stay at home, teach the children, fire and tree worship while you go out and work in the field. And I don't want that, God says. 
So, let's keep reading this. Okay, where was I? Then shall his brother's wife come into him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face. They would spit in a face to confirm a covenant. You remember Ruth? Ruth was a Moabite. She was gorgeous. Boaz saw her, and he fell in love with her. But he wasn't the nearest of kinsmen. So when her husband died, she had to go to the nearest of kinsmen and say, I am yours if you will take me to be your wife and raise up children. And the man said, I cannot, the nearest of kinsmen. I've already got a wife. So Boaz steps forward and says, I will take her. And he took his shoe off and handed it to his nearest of kinsmen. That's a contract. Remember we talked about contracts were acted out. And right here is a part of the contract to take this shoe off and give it to the nearest of kinsmen. So that's what Boaz did. And he bought Ruth. And she was his. So he's saying that right here. So shall it be done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that had his shoe loose. Now you know what Boaz was doing. Taking his shoe off. Now. Now, I told you last week, I read to the 22nd chapter of Matthew where that Jesus was approached by the Pharisees and said, if a man uh, is married and uh, he dies and he has no children and then his brother comes along and he dies and has no children, up to seven brothers in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be? And the Sadducees didn't believe in a physical resurrection. And Jesus said, you do err not knowing the scriptures. They didn't know these verses. They didn't know the scripture. Well, I think that's really funny. But he says that twice. He says that, let's read it the second time. He says that over here in Luke 12 and 18. Luke 12. That's like two witnesses. Remember, everything has to have two witnesses. Two witnesses, Numbers, the 35th chapter, Deuteronomy, the 17th and 19th chapters. It takes two witnesses to confirm everything in Israel. That is said twice in the Gospels. Look here in Luke 12, 18. Luke 12. So we already gave it to you last week. And we're giving you the second witness. We're going to Luke 12 and verse 18. No, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Excuse me. No, it's not Luke 12. It's, uh, I got the wrong verse here. He's got it twice. Twice. Let me see here. I've got the wrong, the wrong chapter. Well, let me go on and, excuse me, Luke 20 and 34, not 12. What am I thinking of? Luke 20. Sometimes I'll put the wrong verses down. Okay. 20 and 34. Now, let me start here in verse, he says it here. Verse 27, Then came to him certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. And they asked Jesus, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If any man's brother die, having a wife, and he die without children, that his brother should take his wife, 
and raise up seed unto his brother. There were therefore seven brethren, says the same thing in the 22nd chapter of Matthew. The first took the wife and died without children. The second took her to wife and died childless. The third took her and a matter up to seven also, and they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also, and therefore in the resurrection, which they didn't believe in, the Sadducees, whose wife of them is she, for the seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, and they which shall be accounted worthy to take to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. And he says it this way, angels neither marry nor are given in marriage, so they couldn't be marrying, marrying descendants of Seth. They couldn't be. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of the Lord, being the children of the resurrection. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush, when he calleth the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. What he's saying is they're living with God right now. Now, there's a chapter I want to give to you, and it shows the practicality of this in Genesis the 38th chapter. And this seems confusing to some people, but it's not. Genesis, the 38th chapter. And you're going to see this with these guys. Genesis 38. This is a practical application of intermarrying or marrying their surviving son. And that's what this chapter is about. A lot of people can't understand this. They think that Tamar, the daughter-in-law of Judah, is doing something evil, and she's not. She's righteous. Verse 1, chapter 38 of Genesis. And it came to pass at that time that Judah, who is Judah? He's the fourth son of Jacob, Judah. And I've got to show you this and show you why God is doing this. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Becomes Israel. And that's in Genesis 32 when he's on his way back to the land of Israel after spending 20 years in the land of Haran or what we would call Iraq or Babylon. So after he spent 20 years, he's coming back. God strikes him down, says, what is your name? He says, Jacob. He'll catch one who trips people up. That's what Jacob means. Jacob was a scoundrel at times. God converts him in Genesis 32. He said, from now on, your name will be Yisrael to prevail with God. And by the way, Jacob was second born, just like Abel was second born. Now, so he said, you will be one who prevails with God. You'll no longer trip people up. And he had been a tripper. Boy, he was something else before that cheated his father-in-law Laban, lied to him, stole from him, lied to his father Isaac, said, I am your I am your firstborn son, Esau. He lied. So, and then he has these sons. He has Reuben, the firstborn. Reuben. And then he has Simeon. And you can find these sons of Jacob in Genesis, the 29th and 30th chapter. And some of them are, some of them are Leah's, his first wife, 
some are Rachel's. His second wife, the one he loved dearly, that was his beloved, Rachel. And then some are Bilhah. That's Rachel's handmaiden. And some are Zilpah. These are the mothers of the sons of Jacob. That's Leah's handmaiden. And then you had Simeon, Reuben, Simeon. And then you had Levi, which out of Levi would come the would come the priesthood. Priesthood. And then you had Judah. And this was a forever kingship. The king will come out of Judah. Jesus was called the Lion of Judah. David was of the house of Judah. By the way, Saul was the first man king of Israel, and David was the first righteous king. Righteous king of Israel. He was the second king. Second, like second, like second born Jacob over Esau. God loved Jacob and hated Esau. Now, let's keep reading this. So, but before I go further into it, let's go back a chapter. Oh, excuse me. Let's go up. Let's go up a few chapters, not back a chapter. Let's go to the 49th chapter of Genesis, then I'll come back to the 38th. The 49th chapter, Jacob gathers all of his sons around him, and he's about to die, and he gives them the blessings and cursings. And he starts off with Reuben saying, you're unstable as water. That's because Reuben had slept with his stepmother, Bilhah. And he was kind of messed up in his head. And it was the prerogative of the, of the patriarch to give the kingship and the priesthood and the inheritance to every will. Well, he gave the priesthood to Levi, his thirdborn, and he gave the kingship to Judah, his fourthborn, and he gave his, the inheritance of Israel to Ephraim, the secondborn of Joseph, his eleventhborn. So there's another secondborn being blessed. And he goes through Reuben, Simeon, and then he gets down here to Judah in verse 8. 49 verse 8. Judah, fourthborn, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise, thy hand shall be on the neck of thine enemies. That means you'll conquer your enemies, Judah. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. You're going to be like a lion, fierce. And from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, as an old lion. Who shall rouse up Judah? And the scepter, the ruling scepter, shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Shiloh is a form of shalom, which is the word peace. That's another name for Christ or Messiah. So he says the final king will be Christ. The scepter will not depart from Judah nor lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him, unto Judah shall the gathering of the people be. And that's why when you get in the thirty eighth chapter, it's Judah that is trying to pass the inheritance to the surviving brother. That's very important. Now let's go back over here to the 38th chapter. And Judah saw there a, there a daughter of a certain Canaanite. 
whose name was Shua. And he took her and went in unto her. And she conceived and bare a son and called his name Er. And she conceived again and bare a son and called his name Onan. And she again conceived and bare a son and called his name Shelah. This is Judah. Now, one of these sons is going to have to inherit the dying son's mantle. And he was at Kezib, whom she bare. And Judah took a wife from Er, his firstborn. Er is in verse 3. And whose name was Tamar. Now, Tamar is his granddaughter. Can you see that? See, Er is conceived by this Shua, this Canaanite, in verse 3. And then Onan is conceived by her. And then Shelah is conceived. And Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn. We're talking about up there in verse 3. He takes a wife for Er, and Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. So you got a dead son. And this is Judah's lineage. One of them's going to be in the lineage of the kings. In fact, this is going to go all the way down to Jesus in the first chapter of Matthew. And Judah said unto Onan, that's his second born, go in unto thy brother's wife, go in unto Er's wife, and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. Well, that's the law over there in the 25th chapter of Deuteronomy, and we're not even to Deuteronomy yet. That's God's law. His law is always. Onan knew that the seed should not be his. He knew when he had a sexual relationship with Tamar, it would not be his, and it would not go down in history as his son. And it came to pass when he went into his brother's wife that he spilled his seed on the ground and not in her womb. You say, that's crude. No, that's what the Bible says lest that he should give seed to his brother. He was saying, I am not going to give my seed and so my brother can have a son in his name. No! God says, that's the wrong thing to say. That's my law. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord. God killed him for that. Who? Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, actually his granddaughter, Remain a widow in thy father's house till Sheila, my third-born son, is grown. Till Sheila, my son, be grown. And he's going to, it's required that he'll come in to you. That's the law. For he said, lest peradventure he die also as his brother did. Just like Seth took the place of Abel. This is really heavy here because this is the only seed that Judah's got. He, God's got to do something to keep this seed alive in this chapter right here. You see that? And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. In the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up unto the sheep shears in Timnath. And he and his friend Hera, the Adulamite, and it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And he, she put her widow's garments off from her 
and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place. What's she doing? She's going to try to make sure the seed, she's doing a righteous thing, that Judah's seed will stay alive because these, he has failed. Judah has failed to give her this one surviving son, the thirdborn. He hasn't given him this surviving son yet. And she saw that Sheila was grown. She's supposed to get Sheila. He grew up. And Judah just ignores it, walks away. It's just big deal. He doesn't understand. Out of him will come the king of Israel. Out of his loins will go all the way down to Christ. And she was given him she was not given to him to wife. And that's Judah's sin. So she takes it on herself to do something about this. And what she does is righteous. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot because she was sitting in an open place. She had a bell on her face. And she had covered her face. And he didn't recognize this was his daughter-in-law. And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. <laughs> it sounds like a mystery, doesn't it? And she's tricking him so she can do something righteous and keep the seed of Judah alive. And she comes from a Canaanite mother. And she said, what wilt thou give me? She sent this to Judah. You've had a sexual act with me. What will you give me that thou mayest come in unto me? What are you going to give me? And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. That will be my pay for this sexual affair that we're going to have. She's doing right, and he's committing sin. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it, till you send me this kid of the flock? And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? She said, Thy signet, thy bracelet, and your staff. Give it to me. I want this pledge so you'll be sure and bring the kid back. And he gave it to her and came in unto her and she conceived by Judah. <laughs> Judah's seed is still alive because out of him, would, out of Tamar will come the seed of God, Jesus. And she arose and went away and laid by her veil and from her and put on garments of her widowhood of her dead husband. And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend, uh, the Adulamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but she couldn't be found. <laughs> he wants to get back his signet, his bracelet, and his staff. And he asked the men of the place, saying, Where's the harlot that was here? that was openly by the wayside. She was practicing her trade over here in this corner. And they said, there was no harlot in this place. You're mistaken. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And then, also the men of the place said, there was no harlot in that place. And Judah said, let her take it let her take it to her, lest we be ashamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. I'm being dishonest. Oh, you're more, being more than that. You didn't give her your youngest son. And that's God's law. And it came to pass about three months after that, 
it was told Judah, saying, Tamar thy daughter-in-law hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her here. It's against the law for a woman to be a harlot in Israel. She has to die for this. When she was brought forth, this is funny. When she was brought forth, she said to her father-in-law, saying, By man whose these are, am I with child. And she raises up the signet, the bracelet, and the staff. You're ready to kill me. It's by the man these belong to. That's you. She played the harlot to keep the seed of Judah alive. By the man whose these are, am I with child discerned? I pray thee, these are, whose are these, the signet and the bracelet and the staff. And Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son, the surviving son. And he knew her again no more, no more intimacy with Tamar. And it came to pass in the time of prevail that, behold, twins were in her womb, and it came to pass when she prevailed that one put out his hand and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread saying, This came out first and it came to pass that he drew back his hand that behold his brother came out first. And she said, How hast thou broken forth this breach? be upon thee, therefore his name was called Pharez, and afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was Zarah. And out of Pharez comes the lineage of Christ. That is an amazing story to me. And I couldn't understand that when I was young. But you have to understand the second born, the one that's that comes next after that, after the one dies. That is, that holds true all through the Bible. Now, let me show you something else. When you go over to, to the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, I don't know if I can get, how much time do I have, Mike? 30, maybe I can get through this. In 1 Samuel, God was the king of Israel. How is Judah going to come out being the king? God's got to arrange it. He has to arrange everything and make it work. All right. The people in Israel get all upset because Samuel is the prophet. When you get to 1 Samuel, you get to 1 Samuel, this has to do with the surviving son. And the surviving son is a picture of the second birth. Let me kind of give you this before I go further. I got to give you another illustration how God has to preserve, how God has to preserve the second born. In the Old Testament, Cain kills Abel. Cain offers the works of his hands. He offers the plant of the of his gardens, works of hands. Works of hands that's firstborn. 
Second born, Abel, offers a blood sacrifice. Sacrifice. Then you've got Japheth, Noah's firstborn, is rejected by God. Secondborn Shem is God's prophet. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Japheth will dwell in the tents of Shem, and Ham will, his descendants, the Canaanites, will be the servants of Shem. So God gives the, he gives the authority to second-born Shem. Then you get down to, you get down to Esau and Jacob, or you get actually get to Ishmael. Ishmael, firstborn, firstborn, first, first, second, second. Ishmael is rejected by God, and the secondborn of Abraham is Isaac. And Isaac is blessed by God, and he's given the land of Israel. He's second born. Isaac is blessed. He gets the land according to the 17th chapter, Genesis 17. And then you get down to Manasseh and Ephraim, the sons of Joseph, And his two sons are Manasseh, firstborn, and Manasseh is rejected, and Ephraim is accepted, and Ephraim ends up with all the inheritance of Israel. Northern Israel was ruled by Ephraim or by Joseph. And long after their death, northern Israel was referred to as Joseph or Ephraim. Then you get on down to you get on down to Saul and David. Saul is the first king, the first man king of Israel, and David is the he's the first king. And David is the picture. Uh, it's the David is the second king, and I believe they are a type of the inner and the outer man. The outer man would be like Saul, and the inner man, <laughs> inner man would be like David. And then you get to Aaron. You actually get to Moses. I'm just putting these in. Aaron was firstborn. He was three years older than Moses. But Moses was blessed and given. that They actually come back up here in this area. But Aaron was blessed, was not blessed by God. God killed Aaron for his wickedness in that 20th chapter of Numbers. And Moses was blessed by God, and he was second born. He was, he was blessed. He was second born. And Aaron was the first born, and Moses was accepted. Moses said, I'm a man of a thick tongue, and I can't talk, God. You want me to go to Pharaoh? And God says, Aaron will be your prophet. He'll speak for you. And when Aaron and Miriam, Miriam, the sister of Moses, murmured against Moses, did God only talk to you? Yeah, that's right. Then God killed Aaron and Miriam at different times. And then both of them were killed in Numbers, the 20th chapter, Numbers 20. Aaron and Miriam. She was the older sister of Aaron and Moses. And then you've got Israel was the firstborn. When the Lord told Moses, you go tell Pharaoh, let my son go, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And Jesus, Israel, just like Cain slew Abel, 
Cain offered the works of his hands. The Bible says that Israel offered the works of their hands in Jeremiah. And God's and the Jesus, not to take from his deity, he was the second born in the flesh. But he was the only begotten of God, mono Gunea. Only begotten in John 3, 16. The only one taken out of God himself. But upon the earth, Jesus was slain by Israel, by the Pharisees, and God conceived and bore another just like Seth. Just like Seth. He bore another, which is the church, in the place of Jesus, whom Israel slew. Now, the first birth is the flesh. That's these bodies we live in. The one that receives the blessing from God is the new birth, the second birth. If a man's not born again, he can't go to heaven. But being born comes from God and not from our will. And this actually takes us back takes us back to the inner and the outer man. The inner man serves the law of the flesh. The, the outer man serves the law of the flesh. The inner man is Christ in you, the hope of glory, and that is our only hope, and that's a picture of all of these second borns in the Old Testament. Second born, second born, second born. Second born, Jacob. Do I have Jacob and Esau on there? Jacob, Esau, Jacob. Oh, Jacob is Israel. Israel. God chose Israel. Rejected. He chose Jacob, second born, and rejected Esau, first born. And if he should have rejected either one of them by their actions, he should have rejected Jacob. That shows you grace. Now, that takes us back to the inner and the outer man. But before I get to that, I've got to tell you this story about David and why God did what he did with Saul. The, do I, how much time do I have, Mike? 20. 20. Let me see if I can cover this pretty quick. When Israel got into Canaan, and they set up a government, they come out of you got Genesis, Ex, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. They're in the wilderness. And when they come out of the wilderness, they come into the land that was given to Abraham back there about 600 years before. And they come into the land, and the person that's ruling them is Samuel. Samuel is the 13th judge. It's the 13th judge. You had all these other judges. You had uh, had Joshua, Othniel, Shamgar, uh, Deborah, Ehud, all these Jephthah and so forth. And when they come into Israel, Samuel is the head prophet. Samuel was kind of like some of the other prophets, kind of like Eli. At, that, at the beginning of Samuel, Eli is the high priest of Israel. He's a descendant of Levi, or actually a descendant of Aaron, which is the high priest. And he's the high priest there, and he had two evil sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and God killed both of them, Hophni and Phinehas. And then you get down to the 8th chapter of Samuel. Now remember, out of what tribe is the king going to come from? It's going to come from the tribe of Judah. And the people murmur against Samuel. They don't like what's going on. He's got two wicked sons. You've had several situations where you had two wicked sons. You had two wicked sons 
with Hophni and Phinehas at the first part of the book. You had two wicked sons with over there in with Judah. Uh, he's got not Judah with Aaron. He's got he's got uh, Ithamar and Eleazar, which are righteous, and he's got two other sons that are unrighteous that God kills them. And when he comes to when you get to the eighth chapter of First Samuel, Samuel's got two wicked sons too. And the people are saying, we want a king. Well, who are they supposed to want as a king? Somebody out of Judah. And so God says, all right. Look at verse 1. It came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel. This is chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. The name of the firstborn was Joel, the name of the second, Abia, and they were judges in Beersheba, and his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. The people said, we don't like that. We want somebody to be our king besides this Samuel's sons. Give us a king. Well, God says, I'll give you a king. It'll be the wrong king out of the wrong tribe. So God is planning ahead. And Samuel tells them here in this chapter, verse 10, Samuel told the people, Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that ask of him a king. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you, and he will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. A king would have 50 of his soldiers run in front of his chariots. So that's what's going to happen to your sons. God has got an arsenal like you wouldn't believe. He's got thunderbolts, lightnings, and earthquakes. How can you beat that with bows and arrows? You can't. What's wrong with you people? The same thing that's always wrong with them. They wanted to see what they could see. And he will appoint over him captains over thousands and captains over fifties. And your sons will go to war. I'm the whole army now, God says. Samuel speaks for the Lord. And will set them to ear his ground and reap his harvest and make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and be bakers and you won't ever see them. And he will take your fields and they'll belong to the king. And your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them and give them to his servants and he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and his servants. And you don't even need officers. God is your whole army. He's never needed him up to here. Why you need him now? He will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. They'll belong to the king, not you. They said, we don't care. Give us a king. God says, okay. And he, <laughs> in the next chapter, it's amazing. Benjamin is the twelfth son of Jacob. Now, there's a man of Benjamin. King can't come out of Benjamin. What tribe does he have to come from? Number four, Judah. God says, you want a king? I'll give you the wrong king out of the wrong tribe. You won't be Judah. And there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite and a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul. Guess who's going to be king? Saul of the tribe of Benjamin. <laughs> wrong king. God says, you want a king? I'll give you one out of the wrong tribe. And he's going to do the wrong things 
just like I told you a king would. He had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and goodly, beautiful, fair. He had much favor. He was the tallest man in Israel. God don't need tall. <laughs> God needs the heart of a righteous man. The children of Israel, a goodlier person than he, for his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any one in Israel. So it don't matter how, how really together a man looks, has nothing to do with anything. Tall don't mean wise. Strong and broad shoulders <coughs> don't mean wisdom. And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And God sends Samuel out to find this man of God. And when Samuel finds him, he anoints him because of the instruction of God that he's to be king over Israel. And he was a goodly man when he started, but he got ornery as a snake as he lived along the way. Why? God had to see to it that he was ornery because he was the wrong king. So when you get into the 11th chapter, he fights against Nahash, one of the Ammonite kings, and he gets mad and gets in a rage. God says, that's not what I want my king to be. From the 11th chapter all the way through the 12th. Well, the 12th chapter is where Samuel comes and anoints him and has his, his coronation rites as king. And he warns him in the 12th chapter, you can't go after these other gods. If you do, you're going to be in trouble. Saul is like paying half attention to him. Saul even offers sacrifice to God and prophesies. Saul is the anointed of the Lord. Even David calls him that. Well, when you get into the 13th, 14th, and 15th chapters, Saul is doing everything wrong. He's supposed to. In that 14th chapter, the Philistines, there's thousands of them attacking Saul. He don't know what to do. He gets beside himself. He goes hide in a cave. He's got a son named Jonathan says, me and my armor bearer will attack the whole army. And Jonathan's a righteous man. Saul is hiding. Well, you get to the 15th chapter. Samuel comes to Saul and says, Saul, I want you to go down to Amalek, the people at Amalek. About 200 years ago, they attacked Israel coming out of, out of Egypt. And I want you to go around and kill everything in the town. Babies, animals, children of all ages. Kill everybody. Utterly destroy Amalek. Ply it to the ground. Well, Saul, he's about winding himself up with God in that 15th chapter. In the 15th chapter, when Saul comes back from Amalek, Samuel looks at him and says, Did you execute the fierce wrath of the Lord against Amalek? He said, Oh, yes, I did. Then Samuel says, I hear the bleating of these sheep. What is that bleating sound? Well, I couldn't help it, Saul says, because the people made me. Nobody makes Saul do anything. The guy was a tyrant. He said they made me bring the sheep back so we could offer sacrifice to God. And Samuel said it's better to obey than sacrifice. Don't you know that? And Samuel looks at Saul and says, your day is over. It's done. Well, God had to make Saul that evil because he's out of the wrong tribe. Isn't he? Yeah, he comes out of the tribe of Benjamin. You're not going to get that out of the ninth chapter unless you study this about the scepter will not depart from Judah. So you've got to have a king of Judah. So, 
Saul starts begging Samuel, please, please, I repent. I'll do anything to keep the kingdom. Samuel says, it's over. It's done. You're not king anymore as far as God's concerned. God comes to Samuel and says, Samuel, I want you to go down to Bethlehem, Judah. Judah. There's a man down there, and I've chosen me a king among his sons. The first king of Israel was Saul. The second king is going to be one of his sons. So Samuel goes down to Bethlehem, Judah. And right at the city limits, all the people meet him out there. They're terrified of the prophet. They know he can call fire from heaven. He can kill them all with a wave of his hand. They're saying, what are you doing down here, Samuel? Oh, you bring fire with you? And he said, I came down here to worship God. He says, take me to the house of Jesse. So he goes to Jesse's house. And he says, Mr. Jesse of Judah, God has chosen a king among your sons. And he said, I wonder who it is. And Jesse said, I know it has to be. It has to be my eldest son. He's taller than anybody else around. Well, God's already had one tall guy, and he didn't work. We don't care how athletic he is. So he made Eliab to come out. Eliab, boy, that was the choice. Not only was it, it, was it Jesse's choice, it was Samuel's choice. And Samuel said, surely this is it. And God said, I have not chosen this. He called Eliab a this. I haven't chosen this. Then he made that great statement, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And then he makes seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. God says, no, 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 seven times. And then he says, do you have any more sons? And he says, there remaineth one, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And he says, go get, he says, I'm not going to leave here, Samuel says, until you bring this one before me. And Jesse turns to one of his children and says, go get David. He brings David in and he says, this is him. God's got to bring some evil upon Saul. Saul hears he hears the word that Samuel has anointed David to be king, and Saul wants to do the wrong thing. He wants to blame David. Say, you're trying to take my throne away. No, God's taken it away from you. And you've got, you got some verses here in chapter 16. When Saul hears this word, verse 14 of chapter 16, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled Saul. He says that several times. After David kills Goliath, over there in the 18th chapter, the Bible says, when, when the women were singing, Saul hath killed his thousands, and David his ten thousands, and it came to pass, verse 10 of chapter 18, that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul. God had to put evil in Saul's heart because he came out of the tribe of Benjamin, wrong tribe. Everything is in arrangement with God. Second born, second king. The only thing that works is the new birth. Born again. And then over there in the 19th chapter in verse 9, Saul is getting bent out of shape. We'll read 8 and 9. And there was war again, and David went out and fought the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter, and they fled from him. 
and the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul because David was getting glory for slaughtering the Philistines with a great slaughter, and he was jealous. But Saul could not be the permanent king. Why? He came from the wrong tribe. The king has to come out of Judah. It's just amazing to me. An evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in the house with his javelin in his hand, and David played with, a, with his hand on his harp, and Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with his javelin, with his spear. And you can blame Saul all you want. David, Saul started chasing David in the 19th chapter, and he tries to kill him all the way to the end of the book. And when you get over there in that 31st chapter of 1 Samuel, Saul is trying to kill David all the way. And every time they get a Saul trap somewhere, Abishai, David's nephew, will say, Uncle David, I'll kill that dead dog for trying to... Even Abishai knew that God had picked out David. Everybody in Israel knew it. Even Saul knew it, but he wanted to blame David for it and kill David. And twice, David had the upper hand on Saul. Once in a cave... And once in a big furrow where Saul and his soldiers went to sleep, and they went over there, like in the cave or in the big valley there, and Saul and his men were sleeping, and Abishai said, Uncle David, I'll kill him. And David said, He is the Lord's anointed. Leave him alone. Can you see how that God preserved the kingdom to Judah in David and over here with Judah in the 38th chapter of Genesis. He kept the kingdom with Judah. When the people got upset and said, give us a king, I'll give you one. He'll be the wrong king from the wrong tribe. That was all the plan of God. Did he plan all that? Well, yeah, he, an evil spirit from the Lord entered into Saul. I hope I've kind of spelled this out for you. I really, this takes us back to the inner and the outer man. I'm out of time. I'm going to come back next week and go further into this. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Lord, I don't know what else to do other than to teach your word. Sometimes I'm so tired, Lord. Give me strength. But more than that, give the people here strength. That's part of the ministry. This is a difficult time with this coronavirus on the loose. Even regardless of how serious it is or how serious it's not, it's certainly a national pandemic of fear. I pray that you'll Give us strength to continue, the people that are listening on the Internet, on the TV, that you'll give them strength to grow, increase their faith. We'll praise you for everything and give you glory and honor for, for it all. Fight our battles. Lord, I can't fight them. You fight them. In Christ's name we pray, man. Well, was a lot of stuff there, wasn't it? God's got a program. He'll arrange evil if that's what he has to do to bring it about. <coughs> I just thank God for his arrangement. He's arranging everything. Hey. Don't get too close to me. No, no, I was just going to say thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. I love you. Thank you. I love you too, Rusty.